Lord Jesus Christ, you fasted 40 days and 40 nights. May we have that kind of vigor in self-discipline and self-control. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're in volume three, page 106, with Canon Richard Watson Dixon's History of the Church of England. A very learned man, Methodistic Anglicans, and yet he retained his Anglican credentials. I forget where he was a canon, but uh, he's largely extremely good, 98%. And we quibble around the edges here a little there, here or there. Um, so anyways, let's, we're picking up here. For, we're in 1549, and Dr. Cranmer has just ordered up visitation to Oxbridge or Oxford and Cambridge. For the rest at Cambridge might be noted the remonstrant attitude of the learned Dr. Learned Redmond, the master of Henry's magnificent foundation at Trinity College, a man who had already encountered trouble in the course of the revolution. That's his description of the Re Reformation with consistency, revolution. And he belonged to the school of Gardner, oh boy, and shared the dislike of his master to the book of homilies. To which the visitors held it to be part of the office to require the college to subscribe Redman hung back for some time, and in other colleges, others were encouraged by his example. But he was a man of more learning than resolution. The visitors had not reached his college when he appeared before them with a written explanation or interpretation of certain sentences taken out of the homilies. If, he said, these sentences may be interpreted thus, though in strictness they may seem to import another sense, I am content to subscribe. <clears throat> the novel expedient was allowed in Redmond's opposition to the revolution at an end, a footnote. Gardner, it is likely that Gardner made some expostulation from the tower. Didn't take long for him to get in there, but Fuller seems wrong in supposing that Gardner was still the president of Trinity Hall. He is certainly wrong in thinking that he was also chancellor of Cambridge at this time, and that Somerset opposed him and took the office himself. Somerset became chancellor when Gardner was sent to the tower two years before, in 1547. We went through all of the circumstances of that uh, back and forth, which was rather extended. And then finally, bye-bye, Steve, which was uh, will not bode well in the future because he'll come back with a vengeance. Cooper's Cambridge, the obstinate Swinburne of Clare, it may be added, remained in his mastership and compelled Medieu to have him turned out by a special commission a year or two later. He was reinstituted in Mary's reign. Another footnote. Mr. Dr. Redman hath this day been before the visitors, and bringing with him an interpretation of three sentences picked out of the homilies, and declaring and making pro protestation that he trusted the said sentences mean nothing, none other thing. But according to his interpretation, though the very words straightly taken might seem, as he thought to import another sense, he was contented to subscribe and did. At other colleges, some do stick and some refuse to subscribe, hanging, it was thought, only on Dr. Redmond's judgment. Now he hath, I think the rest will follow. At Oxford, the suspension of statutes before the visitation began prompted and encouraged an outbreak of zeal among reformant students, which was worthy of the mobs of London or Portsmouth, 
the licensed preachers declaimed in the pulpits, quote, son of her of Babylon was the salutation that greeted the old learning when they appeared in the street, sons of her Babylon. Shocking outrages were committed in the colleges and the English seemed so moderate, modest, balanced, men of common sense, decorum and decency. <laughs> One of the, these are just kids. Um, university students started at what, age 14, 15. So you get a, a bunch of hot, rash youth. One of the junior fellows of Magdalene in the college chapel at Mass on the vigil of Easter, in the sight of a great congregation, many of whom had come from the country for the celebration, advanced to the high altar and dashed the symbols of Christ's body to the ground. Of the same society, another fellow snatched a thurible from a minister and flung his book down. A band of scholars armed with axes. <laughs> we were just talking about axes with the Visigoths on the doctrine of God, where they come in with their Visigothic axes and halberds and lop off attributes from God all at the expense, all to bow before their libertine view of love more like licentiousness. The visitors of the working part of them arrived as in Cambridge in the beginning of May. Whole Beach, May, Nevison, Morrison, Cox was there already. The prefatory sermon was preached not by Ridley, who engaged at the other university, by Peter Martyr, who made a pregnant discourse that all things by human degeneration went from good to bad that here things were gone from bad to worse. <laughs> Light the fires, Dr. Vermigli. And now the reformation desired by all good men was come to reform a great academy, to make it a seminary of good learning to the benefit of the church. Uh, footnote, this may certainly be regarded as back to Redmond. Is the earliest case on record of subscribing in a non-natural sense. Poor Redmond died two years later and how he was persecuted on his deathbed by men of the new learning, asking him questions and taking down his answers like attested depositions, maybe read in Fox. We're working through Fox. He's a good, he's good too despite uh, Maitland's negativities from Lambeth years later. The visitation proceeded in the same way at Ox, at Cambridge. Colleges were summoned, deeds examined, alterations made, funds converted, collegiate chantries were sieged, and chantries of the churches which colleges were patrons. Out of them were founded some exhibitions for students, but the greater part of them disappeared. The choristers and grammar boys of the college schools were turned out. There were 40 or 50 such boys in some colleges, and the schools themselves were suppressed. For this measure, the better accommodation of students provided since all things had pretexts, the pretext, but the dismay and petition of the townsmen, deprived of the means of educating their sons, preserved in Magdalene, still possesses one of those ancient seminaries. The visitation had been delayed, not perhaps without design, until the act of uniformity had inured and it was part of the office of royal delegates to abolish the mass and other old services, to remove the embellishments of the chapels and to establish the new book of common prayer. They imposed new statutes on the university, which were contrary to most things to the old laws. The ardor of Cox, the Dean of Christ Church, the Chancellor of the University, 
was observed on this occasion. Now, Cox, I think this is the same guy. He later becomes a bishop as memory serves to kind of pay attention to Cox. He's the dean of Christ Church, chancellor of Oxford, was observed on this occasion, a constant correspondent of Bollinger of Zurich. As an active reformer, Cox was a great harborer of strangers. At the beginning of the year, he had welcomed Peter Martyr to the chair of theology and society of Christ Church. Into the society of Christ Church, he had inserted both Stumphius and John of Ulm. He is said to have used his power of visitor to provide for his friends and clients with a liberal disregard of the statutes of colleges, <clears throat> which statutes, to be sure, were all suspended. But of all the proofs of vigor with which his name is associated, posterity has the greatest reason to lament the destruction of books and manuscripts, nay, of whole libraries, which was now encouraged by him. I need some footnotes on that uh, here, Rick. The ravages of Leighton and of Henry VIII, 1300, 13 years before, were resumed, exceeded, and comp completed in this visitation. The losses of learning cannot be computed when no fragment remains by which to estimate them. In Merton College, the ancient abode of Ockham and Wickham, Wycliffe lost a cartload of manuscript treatises in theology and the sciences, the labors of an illustrious fraternity. Great heaps of books from Balliol, Queens, Exeter, and Lincoln Colleges were set on fire in the marketplace. The university library itself afterwards, refounded by the munificent Bodley, who was so utterly exterminated it's hard to believe that not a single book or manuscript was left. No footnotes so far. It had been so large that the university afterwards found it worthwhile to sell the empty shelves on which numerous volumes had reposed of this horrible ravage. The blame ought no doubt to be shared by other visitors and by many of the residents. But it is Cox whom history has charged for his activity in the business of Chancellor received the reproachful nickname of the Chancellor of the University. Public disputations, the arrayed contests of arguments and authorities in which contradictory opinions brought into the strongest collision had been made in other countries a notable instrument of the Reformation from the beginning. In England, the solemn, authoritative employment of these usual academic exercises marked in this year a distinctive uh, advance in the alteration of religion. The universities were made to ring with the combats of commissioned divines. The medieval theology was formerly assailed in her most sacred seats. And when Peter Martyr at Oxford, at Cambridge, Ridley, Pern, and Medew thundered in the schools, it was noted by the discerning that now within the realm for the first time in the age, the great Catholic doctrine of the presence, or rather the received explanation of the presence in the sacrament, was put under question by men reputed learned. In particular, the exploits of Peter Martyr in that university, <coughs> which has often been thought less luminous than her sister, <coughs> kindled in the deeper obscurity a beacon or conflagration which struck more sensibly the eyes of the observers. Footnote, Bishop Gardner said in 1551 on his trial that at the time when he preached his famous sermon on St. Peter's Day in 1548, the very presence of 
Christ's body and the sacrament and mass were not was not in any controversy among learned men. Close quote. In this he was confirmed by witnesses. Dr. Brickett says that at the time there was no controversy or contention among learned men of the presence, for the king had sent forth proclamation that no man should speak unreverently of the same, otherwise than the scriptures should bear. Richard Buern of Christ said that when the controversy of the sacrament began, he knew not, but he did not remember any man that did openly teach or dispute of it in Oxford till Peter Martyr began. Hugh Weston said there was no contention of the presence among learned men within their realm until Peter Martyr began to preach it at Oxford. White, then of Winchester, said that since Wycliffe's time, who afterwards reconciled himself, no learned man had called the presence in question till Peter Martyr in his lectures in Oxford called the thing in question. For the doctrine was received, acknowledged, and agreed upon them by the whole clergy and temporality learned in the realm, and by acts of parliament and synods established, and by prelates and other learned men set forth in books and open sermons. John Young, young fellow of Trinity, said that before the time when Gardner preached his sermon, there was no controversy in Cambridge among learned men of the presence of Christ in the sacrament, but it was known and taken universally for a Catholic doctrine. George Bullock of St. John's Cambridge said the same thing. And Christopher, the footnote goes to the next page, back to the text. 1549 is when the disputations begin. Already at the beginning of the year, a disputation seems to have been held in London among some bishops, Cranmer, Farrar, the new incumbent of St. David's, Heath and Thurlby, in the presence of the king and duke, on which occasion the uncle observed with surprise, the nephew with the pleasure of gratified sagacity, how much the traveled Thurlby savored of the interim. In the familiarity of Lambeth, the learned fugitive Peter Martyr gave utterance to opinions which seemed of the Tigurine type, but Peter was destined to a wider scene. He took possession of Oxford, and there his language upon the great subject of the sacrament caused in no long time a violent agitation. At first, indeed, he was measured and dubious, nor in the end can he, I think, be said to have denied the great doctrine of the presence. When he arrived there, he chose to open his academical prelections with the first epistle to the Corinthians, which enabled him to launch into matters of controversy. He chose Ash Wednesday for the occasion of the sermon against fasting, and declaimed against papists and Pharisees, and the pitiful constitutions which set a difference between one kind of meat and another. Got some footnotes. Redman himself, one of the most eminent theologians of that age, said that so far as he remembered, there was no contention or controversy in the matter of the presence among the prelates or learned men of this realm. See Gardner's Matter Justificatory, Article 37, and the depositions thereon in Fox, first edition, or reprinted in Church Historians of England. All this seems to tally exactly with the remark of Peter Martyr after the disputation on the sacrament in Parliament. At the end of 1548, that the difficulty of the present still remained. And we believe that Dr. Cranmer, at the end of 1548, for four days, held forth on the Reformed view of Holy Communion and the Eucharistic presence. 
another footnote. When the disputation was ended, the proctor accosted the king with an expression of surprise, saying, How oh, very much the Bishop of Westminster has deceived my expectation. Your expectation, the king replied, he may deceive, but not mine. When the protector asked why, I expected, said the king, nothing else but that he who has been so long with the emperor as ambassador should smell of the interim, Bircher, the Bollinger. <laughs> the interim, a period of temporary peace when he on the continent, when he ended his discourse by crying with a lamentable voice, Parquita sanguine Christi, Parquita anabus westris, he is said to have moved the admiration of many, nor is it without likelihood that many were to applaud the pleasant doctrine that the right way to spare their souls was not to be too hard on their bodies. But as it regarded the sacrament, his lucubrations were considered by a competent and hostile critic to have been moderate in their tone. Dr. Richard Smith, his predecessor in the chair of theology, listened to his lectures with the ears of a rival and declared that at first Peter Martyr spoke like a Lutheran. Footnote Smith said, Peter Martyr, in his first coming to Oxford, when he was but a Lutheran in this matter, taught as Dr. Smith doth now. But when he came over to the court and saw that doctrine misliked, that them might do heart, hurt him hurt to his living, he soon turned his tippet and sang another song, turned his tippet and turned another song. We do get some good expressions in English from these men. On this Cranmer remarks of Dr. Peter Martin's opinion and judgment in this matter, no man can better testify than I, for as much as he lodged within my house long before he came to Oxford, and I with him many conferences in that matter, and know that he was then of the same mind that he is now, and has defended ever afterwards openly at Oxford, and has written in his works. And if Dr. Smith understood him otherwise in his lectures at the beginning, it was for lack of knowledge. Answer to Smith's preface. Works 373, Parker Society. But Peter appeared dubious or even Lutheran to others besides Smith at this time. Hooper declared that Peter Martyr and Bernardine stoutly defend Lutheranism, original letters, page 61. Hooper, however, was not then in England, but John Ab Ulmus in Oxford at the time said something of the same. He has also maintained in like manner the cause of the Eucharist and Holy Supper of the Lord, that it is a remembrance of Christ and a solemn setting forth of his death and not a sacrifice. Meanwhile, however, he speaks with caution and prudence, if indeed it can be called such, of the real presence, so as not to seem to incline either to your opinion or to that of Luther. To Bullinger, original letters 378. The letter is wrongly dated 1548. It clearly refers to Martyr's lectures at this time. And yet, so dubious was Martyr, the same John had written a week or two earlier to Bullinger jubilantly. Peter Martyr was openly declared to us all on this very day, which I write this letter, what his opinion on this subject, and he seemed to all of us not to depart a nail's breadth from that entertained by yourself. Nay more, he has defended that most worthy man's wingly by the testimony of your opinion against his ad adversaries who falsely object to him that he makes the sacrament a mere sign. 
he moreover declares those persons to be out of their senses who make the body of Christ to be. Footnote will be on the next page. It was only when, after finishing his exposition of the 11th chapter of the epistle, Peter delivered an additional excer exercitation, exercitation on the sacrament that the old learning was roused to attack him. Bills were posted on churches announcing that a disputation would be held the next day. And though it is said to have been done without the knowledge of Smith, it was to him that Oxford looked to maintain the honor of the schools. Richard had the, reputa Richard had the reputation of the first schoolman in England. He had written in defense pick up the footnote, persons are out of their senses, this is Vermigli, who make the body of Christ to be without any local habitation, unsubscribed in many places at once, void of shape and so on, to March 1549. Original letter 388, Peter Martyr himself fully bears out these representations. He published his lectures in the same year with a long dedication to Cranmer. It is evident that they were much smoothed up and they are arranged in the form of an extended Tractatio de Sacramento Eucharistiae in four parts, transubstantiation, consubstantiation, representation, and his own opinion. His treatise is almost wholly taken up with confuting the first of these doctrines. He pronounces the second to be crass, crassa estimatio, though he explains that in his opinion it was not held. Ita ut uno hypostasis efficeritur by those who maintained it, and declares that he had heard credibly. Lutherum non tan crossa revira ista de re sensise. On the third, he says, Winglius non adeo tenetur de sacramentis credit, as to reduce them to bare signs. Extreme language used by both Luther and Zwinglius explains by their mutual desire to save each other from opposite errors. He has no wish to differ from either. Non quod in animo habeam singularis praestantis simoqua, one word, big word, ominous taxere, out Lutherum, out Zwinglian. Zwinglian, Zwinglian held not empty signs, nor Luther any conjunction of sign and thing save a sacramental conjunction. He then strikes his own balance that there is a change effected in the sacrament, sacramentalis mutatio, that the body of Christ is joined therewith in three degrees by the union by, the union by which we are members of him, by the meaning of the words, and in a less degree by the signs and their meaning. Christum coniungi nobis dum communicamus eximia copula, ut qui maniat in nobis et nos en eo, qui de proximo gradu juncitur verbis atqua, id per significationum capulatus tertio loco sibalus, atqua item per significationum quaetamen, est minor quam ille sit uqui pertinet et verba. The efficacy of the sacrament, he adds, is the intervention of the Holy Spirit, since the partaking is after a spiritual manner, quomodo spiritualiter manducabimus absque spiritu sancti, Opera Eucharist, page 620, edition 1562. It is evident that his words might be variously interpreted. 
he seems to hold a position lower than representation, which was Booser's opinion, but above barrenness. Back to uh, uh, Smith had written books in defense of the mass and in defense of unwritten verities or traditions. And his treatises were deemed afterwards important enough to employ the pen of Cranmer to confute them. But hitherto, Cranmer had directed his power, not his pen, against him. And from the beginning of the reign of Smith had been exposed to great trouble and humiliation. He had recanted at Paul's Cross and again at Oxford. And when on the latter occasion he attempted to draw a distinction between recanting and retracting, it said that in London he had retracted but not recanted. He was forced to repeat his recantation publicly in Oxford and that was then deprived of his professorship against the encroaching Florentine who occupied his seat. Smith was willing enough to enter the lists and attended by a crowd of supporters, he went down to the schools. A warning of what was intended reached, but deterred not Peter. He too proceeded to the scene of combat surrounded by his friends, receiving on the way the formal challenge of his rival, entering the divinity school and taking his usual place in the pulpit. He told his adversaries that his first business was to deliver his ordinary lecture, but that he would afterward frame himself for a disputation. His lecture he finished without change of countenance or faltering, but not without some impatient interruptions. And then Smith and the others called upon him to dispute. Peter excused himself, but he was not prepared, nor could be, since, contrary to the practice of the schools, he had never seen, but his adversaries had taken care that he should not see, the propositions to be disputed. He was met with the taunting answer, that the man who'd made so many lectures on the sacrament should be ready upon any question concerning it. As he still hung back, Smith proposed one or two arguments which his party urged and it repeated with great applause. Now we'll have to do that the next time. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen.